you can send it in that way. Um, Eric Schlosser, welcome. It's a real treat to have you here. Thanks for having me. And thank all of you for coming to hear about thermonuclear warfare at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I, I do appreciate it. Um, so the book, which we have here, Command and Control Nuclear Weapons, The Damascus Accident and the Illusion of Safety. I have to say, this is going to sound really odd, this book is funny, and thirdly funny, you might guess, <laughs> not, not hilarious, but this is not a story about buffoonery, this is not a story about incompetence, or a story about, you know, I mean, occasional bits of that are all in there. Is there, is there a single adjective that you could use to sum up what the safety culture was like, what the record was like? Imperfect. And I guess a synonym for that would be human. I try to write about the Cold War, and particularly about our response to the Cold War, not by demonizing anyone, not by making it a simplistic story, but trying to understand the complexity of it and the fallibility of the, of the people who were responding to the Soviet threat. And a lot of the book is about technology. And I think a lot of the lessons in the book are, are applicable to other complex technological systems. And you know, we are incredibly creative and, uh, and come up with extraordinary uh, inventions. But they contain within them our flaws, our inherent flaws. We will never create any perfect system or any perfect machine. The consequences of that are irritating when your laptop crashes and you have a deadline coming in an hour. But when a, a nuclear weapon or a nuclear weapon system goes wrong, the consequences can just be unimaginable. Let me ask you to start by talking about the Damascus accident and the way that it frames the book. Yeah. Without, you know, no spoilers if you don't want to, but I'll tell you, I didn't know much about the Damascus accident and that would keep the pages turning because it interspersed with history and you keep crying about what happened to those guys. Um, but that is, that's the, the top point of the book. You talk a bit about what happened. There was a, a serious nuclear weapons accident in a little town in the foothills of the Ozarks, Damascus, Arkansas, in September of 1980. And I, I will give you this spoiler, Arkansas is still there. <laughs> but there was a real chance that Arkansas would have been consumed by firestorms. And it would have changed the course of American history because the young governor, Bill Clinton, at the time, uh, and his wife, Hillary Rodham, she had not yet taken the name Clinton, and their daughter, Chelsea, who I think was one year old, might not have survived. This accident. And I wrote about the accident. Firstly, it's the reason I wrote the book. An Air Force officer told me the story, and I was amazed that I never heard the story. And that's what made me really look into the issue of nuclear weapons. But the story was very useful for me because it illustrated all of the major themes of the book about technological complexity and human fallibility. But it also seemed like an amazing story in and of itself. And what happened is this. They were doing routine maintenance on a Titan II missile in its silo. And the Titan II was the largest intercontinental ballistic missile the United States ever built. And on top of the Titan II was the most powerful nuclear warhead the United States ever built. This one warhead had more than three times the explosive force of all the munitions used by all the armies in World War II combined, including both atomic bombs. This was an extraordinarily, unbelievably powerful weapon. And they were doing routine maintenance on this missile. There was a workman standing on a steel platform near the top of the missile, and he reached up to unscrew a pressure cap, and the socket fell off of the wrench handle he was using. The socket fell, it hit the steel work platform, bounced, and he reached for it and missed. And the socket fell through a very narrow gap in between the steel work platform and the missile. It dropped about 80 feet, 
hit the silo wall, ricocheted, and hit the missile. And when it hit the missile, it pierced a small hole in the metal skin, and suddenly thousands of gallons of highly toxic, highly explosive rocket fuel filled the silo. So you got and, and the Air Force, the crucial thing is the Air Force had absolutely no idea what to do. You've got a nuclear warhead on top of a rocket. Yeah. So there's a lot that could go wrong. Two things I want to ask about that. First, that doesn't seem unforeseeable that somebody would drop a tool while they're working on the missile. So how could it be that something relatively predictable could be so harmful? There are just so many things that could go wrong in any one of these systems. And in the case of dropping a tool, this missile was first put on alert probably around 1962. And the accident occurred in 1980. And in those 18 years, tools were dropped in the silo on a routine basis. And it wasn't a cause of concern. It was just a total hassle. Because guys would be standing at the top of this missile, and they'd have to go all the way down. We're talking about a missile that's 10 stories high. They'd have to climb all the way down and go beneath the missile, grab their flashlight, grab their screwdriver, grab their wrench, and go all the way back up. And because this was considered a dangerous environment, they were wearing these special suits that looked like space suits. So it was a real hassle, but it was never really seen as a potential cause of a catastrophe. Uh, one of these workmen uh, who I interviewed said that if you had sat on that steel work platform with the socket, and try to pierce the missile, you could have thrown it a thousand times and not hit the missile. So it was a it was a freak accident. And it was a very, very low probability event. And the problem is, when you're dealing with nuclear weapons, low probability events can have very high consequences uh, in the right circumstances. Now the second thing I wanted to ask is, the Damascus accident is not the only accident you talk about in the book. No. There are a lot of stories. Is it, would you call it typical? Was it, it it's not unique. It's, you, you can't come away from this book thinking that this is a unique occurrence. Yeah. Um, where would you, you place it in, in that context, if you would? When you have dangerous technological systems, seemingly trivial events, like dropping a socket, can begin the cascading of events that can lead to catastrophe. Uh, if you look at Fukushima, for example, that was a perfect storm of highly unlikely events. A uh, tsunami of that scale, uh, having the generators on the roof, uh, having the generators where they could be flooded. In, in looking at nuclear weapons again and again, um, I found you know, seemingly trivial events that could have been catastrophic. There was a, a workman who was trying to fix the intruder alarm system at a Minuteman missile site. And so he opened up the fuse box. And again, he's basically trying to figure out what's wrong with the burglar alarm. And he's checking the fuses using the screwdriver. Technically, he's supposed to be using a fuse puller, which is a grounding device, but he's using a screwdriver because he doesn't have his fuse puller with him. So he pulls out one fuse, not a problem. Pulls out another fuse, not a problem pulls out another fuse and he hears a loud explosion and he had inadvertently launched the warhead off of the missile in the silo. And in that case, the warhead did not detonate. It could have detonated. And so you have a well-intended guy with a screwdriver who could have created a nuclear catastrophe in the Dakotas. And I just found multiple examples of that. There was one instance uh, at an, a naval air station not far from Cape Canaveral in Florida, where they were checking the electrical system of an atomic bomb. And that meant they had to plug in their test equipment. And they didn't realize that the plug had pins in it, you know, like the old school things that you plug into your printer, you know, before the modern USB uh, cord. There'd be lots of little pins. And what they didn't realize is that one of the pins was bent. And when they plugged it into the atomic bomb, it created a new electrical pathway, and it fully armed the atomic bomb. Now, that bomb, if it had fallen off of its you know, 
holder could have detonated. And in detonated, detonating would have eliminated a large area of the Florida coastline, including Cape Canaveral. Uh, human beings are brilliant and ingenious, but maybe just aren't up to controlling certain technologies that can have catastrophic effects. So, you know, for this book, uh, I obtained thousands of pages of documents through the Freedom of Information Act pertaining to nuclear weapon safety, but I also interviewed weapons designers from Los Alamos, weapons designers uh, from the Lawrence Livermore lab, weapons designers from uh, Sandia lab, our major nuclear weapons lab. Almost universally, they said to me, it was miraculous that the Cold War ended without a major city being destroyed by a nuclear weapon. And the question is, how much longer can we count on good fortune to protect us from this sort of catastrophe? Well, I have so many questions, but can, can you categorize, or can you... Were the, were the problems systematic blind spots? Here's what I mean. There's a lot of uh, talk in the book, and certainly we all heard about it during the Cold War, about what would happen if someone went rogue or went psychotic. Right. And so there are rules, for example, in the silo in Damascus, there's a no-loan zone. Which is sort of yeah. dramatically unpleasant, but it means you can't go anywhere alone. And somebody else has to be with you, so that well, I guess it's less likely that two people will go crazy at the same time and try to launch the missile. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of thinking about that, and then the side that can just drop. Yeah. <laughs> so is it a case of, of blind spots to certain types of problems? Uh, a lot of it was what are the goals of the technological system. So you could conceive of having nuclear weapons that would be remarkably safe because they're never fully assembled. For example, if you store the nuclear core of a nuclear weapon five miles away from the weapon, there's not going to be an accidental detonation because the thing isn't assembled. But if you have as the goal of your system being able to use your nuclear weapons at a moment's notice, and in the case of missiles, to be able to launch that missile within one minute, that means the warhead has to be fully assembled, that means the missile has to be fueled and ready to go, and it means there's someone at a control panel with the ability to launch it like that. That creates an inherently more dangerous system. And one of the things I wrote about in the book was this tension that existed uh, in the designers of this nuclear command and control system between the desire of the military to have its nuclear weapons always available for immediate use. We need to be able to launch within a minute and always detonate when they land over a target because the military didn't want to have, the Air Force didn't want to have pilots risk their lives flying all the way to the Soviet Union, encountering anti-aircraft fire, and drop a nuclear weapon and then have it be a dead. So they wanted to make sure these weapons work and they're always reliable. But then there were other people within the system, particularly the civilian leadership, who wanted to make sure a weapon would never be used without proper authorization, that a, never, a weapon could never be stolen that a weapon would never detonate by accident in peacetime. And one of the problems is the sorts of mechanisms that you would use to guarantee always are exactly the opposite of the mechanisms you might use to guarantee never. So there was this constant tension between always and never. And in the book I write about how again and again the decision was made to favor always. So it's quite remarkable. Uh, but up until the early 1970s, there was nothing to prevent an American bomber crew from taking off with its nuclear weapons, flying towards Moscow, and dropping them on Moscow. There were no mechanisms, there were no locks on our weapons. Um, there was nothing to prevent a Titan II missile crew, two guys with their keys, from going over and turning their keys and launching a missile at the Soviet Union. Uh, the only thing that prevented that was the training and the patriotism and the discipline of 
of our officers. And I give enormous credit to the Air Force that they never had two guys who said, hey, let's see what happens when we launch. But you mentioned the no loan zone rules, which are basically you always need two guys present when they're with a nuclear weapon or where they're near the controls to launch or use a nuclear weapon. Uh, and that assumes there's only going to be one rogue officer or one person who has a psychotic episode. But if you had two insiders, if you had two people who agreed, let's do this, let's destroy Moscow, up until the early 1970s, there was nothing to prevent that from happening. And so the film Dr. Strangelove was hugely attacked by the Pentagon, by the Air Force, when it was released. And the central plot element of Dr. Strangelove is there's an American general who goes crazy and decides to start World War III. And it's incredible to think today that Dr. Strangelove was a more accurate portrayal of some of the problems in the nuclear command and control system than anything that you could have read in the American mainstream media. And that's because Kubrick really did his research well. But he also took this leap in thinking about what could have gone wrong that the American media wasn't really willing to do. But privately, in the Defense Department, there were people very worried about exactly the scenario of Dr. Strangelove and doing everything they could to figure out ways to prevent it, but it took about a decade for them to, like today there are locks, there are mechanisms that you know have to have the proper code before our airmen could launch a missile before they could drop a bomb. But, uh, that is a slightly mind-boggling part of the book, that, yeah. that number one, that those weren't always there. But number two, that there were fractions in the defense, uh, not industry, but uh, in the defense world, uh, who didn't want them on there. Even yeah. when they became possible, they didn't want them on there because of the always never problem. Yeah, and there's a real logic to the argument against having locks. Uh, under the law, the President of the United States is the only person authorized uh, to say that nuclear weapons can be used. So let's say the President is the only person who has the code that's then transmitted to our bombers and our missile troops. And then let's say Washington, D.C. is destroyed in a surprise attack, the President is killed, and the code is incinerated with him. Suddenly, all of our nuclear weapons are duds. And that was the military's fear. So then it becomes an issue of code management. The more tightly you control the code, the more tightly you control your nuclear weapons from the very top. But if your top officials are killed, you can't use your weapons. But then if you disperse the code widely among your nuclear forces, so lots of people have the code, that means lots of people have the ability to launch your nuclear weapons. And uh, for most of the Cold War, relatively low-level officers had the ability to use American nuclear weapons. And it's a testament to their training and professionalism that they didn't. You mean as a technical matter, they had the possibility, the capability of launching or detonating a nuclear weapon? Uh, again, up until the early 1970s, if, uh, if a crew, not just of a bomber, but we had fighter planes with nuclear weapons, if one of those pilots was flying with his nuclear weapons and decided, you know, I'm going to make a right turn and I'm going to head straight for Moscow, there was nothing to prevent him from doing it, turning the key, dropping his powerful hydrogen bomb on Moscow. Um. And uh, we are very fortunate that none of those people had psychotic episodes. But you, you look at some of the you know, issues in the, in the military today, and uh, the, uh, the officer who went berserk uh, in, um, in Texas, I think was at Fort Hood, and was just shooting as many people as he could. Uh, someone going berserk or someone having a psychotic episode and having access to nuclear weapons would have consequences that are just exponentially worse. And there were people 
in the Defense Department worried about that very thing. Privately, while publicly denying that was a problem, while publicly saying there's no possibility that any rogue officer could ever use a nuclear weapon, and that was just a lie. The other thing that was publicly said is there's no chance that one of our nuclear weapons could ever detonate by accident, and that was just false. And, and one, of the, one of the narratives of my book is about a small group of engineers at the Sandia National Laboratory, one of our main weapons labs, who realized in the late 1960s, oh my god, there's a chance that our nuclear weapons might detonate during an accident, and they just were determined to install modern safety devices in our weapons. And you would think, once they came up, once they realized there was a problem, you'd think, at the highest levels of our government, the reaction would be, we should put these safety mechanisms in there immediately. But it took almost 20 years to make our nuclear weapons really safe in an accident environment. And that, because, that was because there was this denial, there was a, a sense of bureaucratic denial of confronting the reality that almost all of the weapons uh, in the nuclear arsenal, we're talking about tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, have fundamental design flaws that need to be addressed. Is it correct to say that to a great degree, the problem is always never a problem, is a problem of any weapon. In other words, anything that's going to be able to do damage, the same way that the less is going to be able to do damage on a moment's notice exactly when you want it to and where you want it to. And I'm not, I'm not trying to trivialize yeah. anything, but you know, this, if the gun has a safety on it, you can't use it that instant. You have to take the safety off first. Yeah. Uh, this may sound too technical, but there are two different issues. One of them is nuclear weapons safety. That is, if you accidentally drop something from a plane, or if there's a fire, uh, there's a fire in your missile silo, is the weapon gonna detonate? And we made enormous progress in the issue of nuclear weapons safety, so that today the nuclear weapons that the United States has in its arsenal are vastly, vastly, much, much safer than the ones that we had 30 or 40 years ago. So that's the good news. But then the always never part of it is use control. How do you control your weapons? And unfortunately, as long as you want your nuclear weapons available for immediate use, there's going to be the risk that somebody who shouldn't could. Uh, today, we have 450, 449, 450 powerful, powerful nuclear warheads on top of missiles in the Midwest, ready to launch very quickly. And uh, there are reasons to be concerned. Our Minuteman three missiles were put into the ground uh, in the early 1970s. They were supposed to be retired uh, in the uh, early 1980s. So we're talking about 40-year-old weapon systems. The, the computers are aging. The cables that connect the missiles to their launch control systems are aging. Uh, 60 Minutes did a terrific report this year that showed how old these launch control centers are. I mean, the control centers date back to the early 1960s. So we're talking about 50 years old. And um, a very strong argument could be made that we should not have these missiles ready to go on a moment's notice when they're 40, 50 years old and when the infrastructure is aging and I think in many ways increasingly obsolete. So unfortunately, even though most of my book is historical, the threat never went away. The danger never went away. What's gone away is the awareness of it. What's gone away is the public attention to it. And we really need a debate, uh, a very vigorous public debate about our nuclear weapons. Why do we have them? How would we use them? How many do we need, if any? Where should they be aimed at? It's remarkable how little knowledge 
most people in the United States have on those subjects. Whereas, you know, when I was younger, um, when I was you know, in high school and in college, in, into the 1980s, this was something that was constantly being discussed and debated, but it's, it's been largely forgotten. Can you talk a bit about the documents that were the basis for a lot of your research? Where did you get them from, and who had seen them before you? That's a very good question. Uh, the crucial documents that I was able to obtain uh, had to do with the safety problems with our nuclear weapons and some of the use control issues, like, oh my god, someone who's psychotic could just use one of these weapons. And um, somebody gave me one document, and it wasn't a classified document, they weren't violating the law, but the most beautiful thing about this document is it had an extraordinary bibliography and was heavily footnoted. And all those documents were highly classified, the most top secret imaginable. But once I had the names of those documents, I was then able to do Freedom of Information Act searches that were extremely specific. So if you were to go to the government and say, I want documents on the risks that our warheads might explode by accident, they might not give you anything, or they might give you some document that didn't really say anything. But once I had the names of very specific memos with who wrote the memo, what the title of the memo was, the date that it was sent, who it was sent to, it was almost impossible for the government to deny that they didn't have it. It took years for them to release some of these things. Well, I'm, I'm and, and when they were released, you'd be amazed at how much of it would be blocked out. But um, I was able to get some very good stuff. These were documents that had been declassified? No. I mean, this boy doesn't get you everything. <laughs> no, I asked for these very specific documents to be declassified. Okay. So what that meant was a government censor had to read them and decide what to block out. But the beauty of censorship in a huge bureaucratic system is that it's not one guy doing it. So by getting multiple documents on the same subject, that were declassified by different people. Different people would decide what needed to be blacked out, and by comparing different documents, you could get a remarkable amount of information. I mean, the, 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 the whole system of secrecy is so Kafka-esque. That's the only way to describe it. And look, I love this country. There's no molecule of me that wanted to publish anything that would genuinely threaten the national security of this country. And nuclear weapons are the greatest national security threat. I didn't want to reveal anything about our nuclear weapons or our command and control system that would endanger this country. But it was clear to me through the documents that I obtained and the way that they were censored, and by putting them together, that 99% of what was blacked out in these documents was blacked out to protect the government from embarrassing details and to protect bureaucrats from embarrassment, not to protect the national security. And you know, on the one hand, I give our country enormous credit because we have been more transparent about our nuclear weapons program and we have allowed the release of more documents about it than any other country that has nuclear weapons. And so I give credit to that extent and yet we need much more transparency still on this issue, because for the public to have a meaningful debate on what I think is the most important national security threat, we need to have adequate information. And this book was my attempt to provide to the general public information that's been known by high-level government officials for half a century. And so what we've had is we've had a small number of policymakers making decisions of existential importance in secret. And I think it's hugely important that the American people be part of that process of discussion and debate. And uh, if it means that some government officials from the past have to be embarrassed, they earn the embarrassment. Well, so to the, the second part of my question is, who saw those documents before you? And I guess more importantly, who didn't see them? 
These are compendia, of, some of the documents are compendia of nuclear accidents that have been happening since the 1950s. Um, mostly, well, entirely, I think, on the safety side. In other words, not people getting control of weapons or shooting the patent roll. Although, also breakdowns in, in, in security. Um, who, who didn't know about this who needed to know about it? One of, one of, the, one of the other Kafkaesque elements and one of, the, one of the sources of greater danger was that there was incredible compartmentalized secrecy during the Cold War when it came to nuclear weapons. And that meant that, um, for example, the people who were designing the nuclear weapons became aware of safety problems with those weapons. But the people who were handling the weapons in the field didn't have access to the documents outlining the safety problems. And so they might be literally sitting on a weapon having their lunch because that, you know, the nuclear weapon repairmen uh, and maintenance guys had been told there's no possibility that one of these things can ever explode. And if they had realized that some of these weapons were vulnerable to detonating even if they dropped from a height of six feet, they might not have been sitting on them and having a coffee. At the same time, the problems that the guys handling the weapons in the field were having with weapons were often not communicated to the people who were designing the weapons. So I was able, through the Freedom of Information Act, to get documents pertaining to both elements. Documents from within the weapons labs about the safety problems, and documents from the field about, you know, one day this warhead started smoking. We opened it up. We found there was a short circuit in X component, and that was the cause of the fire. So I got one document that was like 250 pages, 275 pages, that was just about accidents and incidents involving nuclear weapons from about an 18 year period. I think it was, gosh, I'm trying to remember the period. I think it was like 1950 to 1968. And I showed it to one of our top nuclear weapons designers. And he was stunned because he had been designing nuclear weapons through that entire period and no one had told him about dozens and dozens of accidents in the field involving some of the weapons that he had designed. There just was not communication. It's almost like, if you think about it, an old James Bond movie, there's Q who's designing these contraptions that James Bond uses and you know has no idea how they're actually being used in the field. And this is a guy, you're talking about Robert Purefoy. And that's Bob Purefoy. This is a guy who was making what seemed like pretty tremendous efforts, even career risking efforts to improve the safety of nuclear weapons. Right. And he's the one who's not, you know, he's designing them, he's trying to design them safer, and nobody's telling him what's going on. He's the vice president of one of our three nuclear weapons labs. He's, you know, number three in the hierarchy, and he's not being told about significant incidents, you know, short circuits, fires, et cetera, et cetera, regarding. And again, this is part of the civilian military rivalry. It's part of the compartmentalized secrecy. And it's also about bureaucratic complexity. Uh, these are very complex bureaucracies uh, involving you know, thousands of people and thousands of weapons. And um, you know, if it's about Walmart losing some flat screen TVs from their storage facility, because their inventory management isn't ideal, well, that's a bummer. But if it's about the Air Force losing a few nuclear weapons from its storage facility, or losing Arkansas, or losing Arkansas, that's a catastrophe. You quote some of the documents in the book, and I will say this is where some of the dark humor comes in, because it, some of the, the stuff you quote is written in this very dry, yeah. very deadpan. What my favorite sentence, I think, I think I'm quoting it approximately or close to right was the fireball was accompanied by a loud noise. <laughs> I suppose it would be. Well, I mean, I think, and, I mean, I think you're referring to there was a plane, uh, a transport plane, transporting nuclear weapons, a lot of nuclear weapons in it, and uh, it got struck by lightning, and a ball of lightning went right through the plane, and it was accompanied 
country by a lot of noise. And uh, <laughs> the problem was, at that point, there was concern that a lightning strike could detonate nuclear weapons. Uh, because basically, you know, nuclear weapons are very complex, but to simplify it, what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to get electricity to the detonators. Because the detonators are wires, and they once they have the electricity in them, they can set off the charge, and the whole thing will detonate. It's very simple, but there was concern that a lightning strike could do it, and this was significant because some of the missiles that we had in Europe with powerful thermonuclear weapons. I mean, we're talking about weapons hundreds, if not thousands of times more powerful, uh, hundreds of times more powerful than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we had big missiles outdoors, not in a silo, that got struck by lightning. And a lightning strike could have detonated one of those things. So, you know, you could look at my book and you could say, well, we had all these accidents, and it never happened. Maybe, maybe that means it can't happen. Or maybe that means it won't happen. Or the way that the laws of probability work, maybe the next time we have an accident, it's going to happen, because we've gotten a free pass again and again and again. Uh, very improbable things happen in the world. And Right now, now that we have the new safety, all these new safety mechanisms that I said have made our weapons much more safe, even with these incredible new safety mechanisms that have been invented, you know, the probability of a weapon detonating full scale in an accident is one in a million. And you know, one in a million, that sounds like it's totally unlikely. Well, you know, look at the lottery. Somebody wins the lottery. And I think the odds of winning some of these lotteries is something like one in a hundred million, and yet that person defied one in a hundred million odds and won the lottery. Uh, the odds of you're dying in a, in a commercial airline crash vary, but I've seen different statistics. One in nine million, one in 20 million. Uh, I know two people who died in different commercial airline crashes. So highly unlikely, improbable, low statistical probability things happen, and you just don't want one of those things happening with a nuclear weapon, or with an entire nuclear command and control system that can launch multiple missiles simultaneously. Let's take some questions. I think there are folks out in the audience with microphones. Okay, why don't we come down here to this corner? The command and control mechanisms of other nuclear powers, such as North Korea, yeah. Deeply concerned. And I'm very critical of the management of our nuclear arsenal. And yet in the book I say, we invented this technology, we perfected it, and we probably have the best controls. Uh, so what does that mean about India? What does that mean about Pakistan? Russia? And at the end of the book, I look at the rates of industrial accidents in those countries as a rough measure of their ability to manage complex technological systems, and it's not encouraging. Now, those states that have nuclear weapons that might be safer are the states in which the weapons are not fully assembled. You know, again, if the nuclear core is here and the weapon is a mile away, you're not going to have a, a, a problem. And some of those states claim that their nuclear weapons are not fully assembled, although I believe that Pakistan's now are fully assembled. Uh, Israel's are probably not. But France, Great Britain, Russia, uh, their weapons are fully assembled, ready to go, and they have to deal with all the same challenges that I write about in the book. So is it fair to say that if we are at one in a million probability, everyone else is at a higher probability? Uh, in terms of the safety of their weapons, each country and its weapons designs have a different probability. And when they uh, captured uh, the Iraqi blueprints for their nuclear weapons, uh, one weapons designer saw them and said, 
that's a really bad design, and I wouldn't want that thing to fall off of the table, literally, because of how unsafe a design it is. So any country that chooses to have nuclear weapons must recognize those weapons pose a, a grave threat to themselves, maybe even a greater threat to themselves than to their enemy. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do safely. We have a here on the end, this gentleman in the red shirt. Did you uh, get any documentation on the strategic response from the Soviet Union, in, in our case, if a nuclear accident occurred within the United States? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was in graduate school in the mid-70s in Washington, D.C., and we had a seminar with some of the arms control people from the Department of Defense, and their argument was if we saw an explosion occur within the Soviet Union, even though we knew it wasn't ours, we couldn't be sure that the Soviet Union knew that. And so the most practical response would be a full launch of our weapons on the Russia Act. Yeah. Did you see anything comparable to that? I didn't receive any documents, but I did speak with very high-level government officials about that very issue. It was a, it was a huge concern, huge concern, uh, because if we had one of our weapons detonated by accident, we might not know if it was an accident. I mean, if suddenly one of our major military installations was consumed by a mushroom cloud, uh, and the way that uh, you know these command and control systems work, if you're under attack and you don't use your weapons immediately, you may never be able to use them. Uh, there was great concern about figuring out exactly what is going on. Now, I never heard anyone say that if the Soviet Union had an accident, that we would launch to destroy them, etc. But it was a it was a huge, huge concern. And uh, you know, there were concerns about the Soviet Union deliberately sabotaging one of our weapons and by destroying an American city, creating a huge you know, public revulsion against nuclear weapons within the United States. And these sound like crazy, paranoid fantasies, but so much of what was done during the Cold War now looks like a crazy, paranoid fantasy. Um, it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense in the Kennedy administration and, um, and, and during the Johnson administration, was very, very worried about one of our weapons detonating by accident because this North Carolina uh, accident where we almost had a hydrogen bomb detonated in North Carolina, that occurred just a few days after he took office as Secretary of Defense, and it scared the hell out of him. But he was also very scared that one of our officers might deliberately use a weapon without proper authorization. And so he made clear, and he talked to Kennedy, about not wanting to launch any of our weapons until we could be sure that that sort of explosion was actually you know, the, the beginning of a Third World War, not an accident, not a saboteur, et cetera, et cetera. But these are the sorts of dangers that exist when both sides have hundreds of missiles and thousands of weapons ready, ready to be used like that, and fearful that if they don't use them, they might be destroyed by the enemy. Down here in the front. Oh. Writing the book, I assume, must have made you aware of the whole general concept of system fragility. And this book is, this, these cases are the extreme cases of fragility that inadvertently unleashes a terrible harm. Yeah. Now that you're hypersensitized to system fragility, uh, what's the one that really worries you? I'm really worried about the I'm not apocalyptic. I don't think any of this is inevitable. I don't think we're doomed. But I'm worried by how little attention it's receiving. And if any 
city anywhere in the world is destroyed by a nuclear weapon, it is going to be a transformative event and a horrible event. And I would really hope that we can make changes without that ever happening. I was in New York City on 9-11, and I went down to the World Trade Center, where I'd spent a lot of time, and I saw it with my own eyes. And to see what's happened to the world, two major wars, uh, transformation of American society, uh, surveillance state, uh, on and on and on, and I'm not trying to minimize it, but all of that is a result of the death of 5,000 people, every one of those a tragic loss. If a city is destroyed, and there's the prospect of other cities being destroyed, and, and it will change everything. And I don't think it's inevitable, but we really need to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. So, you know, I'm really concerned about global warming and I'm active in, on that issue. This is an immediate threat and it's irreversible if it happens. What is the solution? Is the solution complete disarmament? I support what the President of the United States supports, which is the abolition of nuclear weapon. And um, it's not going to happen overnight. It's something that presidents, starting with Harry Truman through Ronald Reagan, have pushed for. Uh, I'm going to Vienna in the first week of December, where the government of Austria is holding an international conference that will be attended by 150 to 160 countries. The discussion will be the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. You know, we have banned biological weapons by treaty, chemical weapons by treaty, cluster bombs by treaty, landmines by treaty, and the logic of banning all those weapons is that they disproportionately will harm civilians. Uh, nuclear weapons exponentially more dangerous than any of those weapons. There is no country in the world right now, if there was a nuclear detonation in one of their cities, that could respond to it, that has the infrastructure in place to have the emergency response to the detonation of a nuclear weapon in a city. So that means we've got to get rid of these machines. And you know there is a there is a growing movement in the world do that. And what that means is there needs to be more public awareness. There needs to be a movement aiming for the abolition of nuclear weapons. And there needs to be negotiations between the countries that possess them now, especially the United States and Russia, which have 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, but also China, which has never revealed how many nuclear weapons it has. It probably only has a few hundred, but until China publicly reveals how many nuclear weapons it has, it's going to be very difficult for Russia to reduce the numbers that it has. I mean, Russia has to be concerned not only with the United States, but also with China. Uh, Pakistan has the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world, and Pakistan and India are recreating the sort of nuclear arms race we once had with the Soviet Union, which is total madness because they share a border. The flight time of the missile between Pakistan and India is something like six minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes. So the pressure to make a very quick decision whether to use the nuclear weapons is much greater than we had during the Cold War. So all these countries need to become engaged in this issue. Uh, one of the things about the detonation of a nuclear weapon anywhere in the world is it's going to have consequences far beyond the borders of the country where that weapon detonated. And this is something uh, in Western Europe that I'm going, to, I'm going to go speak about. You know, Sweden may be a neutral country, but if a weapon detonates in Russia, not that far away, uh, the fallout doesn't you know, care about uh, national boundaries on that. So there's the beginnings, just the very beginnings, of a new anti-nuclear movement. And there are many countries that have signed on to 
of all single nuclear weapons. And we need to get uh, those countries that have nuclear weapons today as part of that movement. Okay, we are just, we're basically out of time, but I'm going to yeah. push one more question in um, because I wanted to ask you to talk about the project you're currently working on. I'm working, uh, my next book is on a subject that's actually less depressing yeah. this one. Uh, it is, it is. I'm uh, writing a book on the American prison system. Oh. And I have been going into prisons uh, for almost 20 years now. And you would think that I'm a depressive or I am a masochist. And on the contrary, I would argue that I'm an optimist. And the reason I do this is because these problems can be solved and I'm willing to immerse myself in them out of the belief that things don't have to be the way they are. And if the nuclear weapon command and control system is completely illogical, looking at the correctional system of this country takes that illogic and you know, quadruples it. And we don't need to be locking up millions of poor, drug addicted, often mentally ill people we can find much less expensive, much more humane ways to deal with those people. And so that's the spirit in which I approach the subject, not trying to bomb people out or wallow in misery. Is these problems can be 